said, I know, man, but this time I can't move. I flipped my head up to the sky, I said, God, I said, surely nothing is happening in this moment that can alter my life. They got me over to the hospital, they took me back, they ran CAT scans, they brought me back into my room. and all The point where we're willing to impose our will on certain things. Impose your will. I will separate myself from Absolutely. whoever's walking with me by a minimum of 50, 60, 70 yards. We'll, Absolutely. We'll, we'll still walk, but that way I'm not hearing my buddy's footsteps you know, clouding up the things that I'm hearing because maybe when my foot hits the ground and I scuff a bunch of rocks, a gobbler way off in the distance sounds off and that crunch of the rocks or me stepping on a twig or whatever kind of drowned that gobble that was off at a distance and completely drowned it out. Whereas my buddy who's back behind me on maybe at that moment, at that particular moment, might be on softer grass or his foot was in the air and he was quiet, he picked it up. So if you separate yourselves out, you can hear a lot more effectively. And I'll add to that a lot like um, archery elk cunning or such. When the person that's walking behind, it's not a matter of, oh, I'm walking in front and I'm the lead dog and I'm better. It's we're working as a team. You're listening. I'm listening. When I stop, you stop. If, 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 if you're leading, Chris, and you stop, I have to be keen and aware of what you're doing because you may see turkeys at 75 yards that I don't see. Yes. Don't just come walking up yes. to your buddy. Hey, what's going on? Yes. Yes. You know, when the person that's leading stops, the person in back stops. The person that's leading looks or whatever they're doing, they may give the signal, I heard one, yep. get down. Yep. They may give the signal, I see them, you know, point to your eye, get down. They may say, just hold up the hand and say, just let's, let's just listen here for a second, you know, give the, you know, point to your ear. The person in back needs to be on all, full alert. Then the person that's leading says, okay, everything's good. Give the, okay, let's keep moving. It's important to work as a team and it's important to be, you know, I, I maybe take it way too serious, but I try and be as efficient and as effective as I can. And, and by being very observant and being very stealthy and very predator-like, that, that enables me to kill more birds. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I tell people this all the time, and it's the same thing with elk. I can go hike in the woods 365 days a year. I have a turkey tag in my pocket for a limited time. My, I want to have fun. I want to go out with friends. I want to have a blast in the, in the woods turkey hunting. But I'm there for a reason. I want to fill my tag. I want to hunt. This is, this, I, take, I do. I take it seriously. I can have fun doing it, but I take it serious. So yeah. there was, that was the other thing you touched on, the, the walking. Um, you talked about you know, listening for other people out there crow calling or, or whatever calling. And I, I want to touch on that real quick. If we are talking about scouting for tomorrow's hunt, okay, and so far, we most of what, our, what we've been talking about is kind of in the evening, listening, roosting, and kind of maybe hinting at the fact that we're going to hunt the next morning or we're going to go after them the next morning, okay? If that's the case, if I'm going to go after them the next morning, yes, I don't. I, in that case, I don't mind picking up the box call and throwing out some yelps or cuts or whatever and try to get a response. And I do the exact same thing you do. Uh, if I get a response, whoop, I shut up. Because at that point, I want the turkey to think that I might be moving his way because I don't want the turkey come smoking up the ridge line and see me or run into me and I spook him and then on oh, a great now where the heck is he going to be? Okay. I don't want to spook birds. I just want them to sound off. So if I'm hunting the next day, yes, I don't mind using a turkey call. However, if we're talking about preseason scouting a week or 10 days before season and you're just game planning it, man, this may be where I kind of, I, I Maybe I'm not popular with it, but I just do not recommend people using a, a, a turkey call because you're just educating, especially on public ground. Most of these birds are going to be pressured anyway. You're just giving, you're just starting the whole process of educating those birds early. And I know that some people get excited. You know, they get up there, yelp, yelp, yelp. A bird gobbles. They're like, yes, I'm going to yelp some more. And he gobbles some more. And they yelp some more. And he gobbles some more. And they're like, this is awesome because you know we've been itching to get out in the field 
Well, keep in mind, the more you get that bird fired up, the more likely it is he's going to come over and look for you. Maybe not that evening, but very likely the next morning. Well, if you do that, and he gets fired up, and the next morning he comes looking for you, and he finds nobody. And then the next night, somebody else goes up there and does the same thing, and he gets fired up, and the next morning he goes running over there to look for him, and he finds nobody, as far as hens. It doesn't take, especially an older gobbler, it doesn't take them very long to figure out, I'm not going to go chase after hen sounds. I'm just going to gobble and make them come to me, because this is a waste of time. So I really stress for folks, if you're doing extended preseason scouting, you know, use your crow call, use your coyote howler if you need, or an owl hoot. Um, but man, I just really refrain from using turkey sounds. And with that being said, too, is you might find some of you eastern hunters that are coming west, or some of you western hunters, you very well may find in some places an owl hooter works great, but a coyote call or a crow call are, are pretty much worthless. Or maybe a crow call is what they want to respond to, but a coyote or an owl is worthless. They don't respond. Have a variety of locator calls with you because you might find that they respond to one and not the other. Um, and then the only other thing, Jay, that I was going to touch on, something you mentioned, um, depending on where you, because you talk about getting yourself to a vantage point or getting up on those ridges where you can hear, absolutely. Get to the spot where he gives you the most commanding uh, position of where to, to listen from or watch from with the caveat out of the wind. If it's windy, you're, you're, you're done. Now, anything upwind of you, so if the wind is going, say, from the west to east, if you're standing on a knob, you very well might hear any bird that's west of you because the wind is carrying that volume. But you might have a bird east of you a half mile in a good vantage point that just the, the sound of the wind or whatever is just stopping you out. Sound waves don't necessarily die. I mean, they will die a little bit, but sound waves sound waves will carry regardless of whether you're in the wind or out of the wind. So if it's windy or breezy, get yourself on the sheltered side of a ridge so that way if a bird does gobble, you can pick it out over the wind noise and the wind isn't just pounding you in the head. All right, now I'm done. <laughs> Absolutely. Great stuff there. Um Okay, let's cover what to do when you're listening at prime time in a roosting location and a bird gobbles. And I'm going to read through this and then we can talk about it. <clears throat> Try to spot the bird with your binoculars and identify his exact position. And I'm also trying to identify is he, you know, how long is his beard? Does he look like a mature bird? You know, how many birds are with him? Uh, if you have to move, be very cautious not to spook the birds. The worst thing you can do when you're trying to roost birds is spook them. I would rather not know exactly where they're at and not and not spook them or let them know I'm in the country than to know exactly where they're at and have them know that I'm there. Yep, absolutely. Identify if he's alone or with other birds by looking with your eyes and listening with your ears. And guys, I'm going to tell you, fight the urge to call to the birds. There is no reason to call to these birds unless you're trying to kill them. I always say don't call to them unless you're, the, you know, season's open and you're trying to kill a bird. And even that, if the season's going and this is mid-season and I'm still trying to roost a bird, unless he's going to be coming where I think he is, I'm not going to be calling to this bird until I'm ready to kill him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, and, uh, and real quick with that, again, if I'm now, I might call to a bird the evening before if I'm close. If if all like we talked about before, if I know that a bird gobbles and he gobbles like once right before dark or whatever, and I think I, he might have hands, he might not have or whatever. If if I think there's a strategic advantage of letting the bird know that hey, there might be a hen roosted. Over. Absolutely. I, I might use my calls and make it sound like, and I'll use a, a real wing, you know, actual turkey wing, and I'll fly up. I'll make it sound like a bird flew up because if that's, you know, maybe the the best access point from where I can park to where I can get set up on that bird, that is the closest I can ever get, but I'm going to need that bird to come to me. 
well, then sometimes it may make the benefit of, of letting that bird think I flew up there. But Jay's right. If if you're not in a strategic location, if you're not using it for a specific tactical purpose, don't because you're just going to compound. You, you you can cause more harm than good. Absolutely. Uh, many times you'll hear one bird or multiple birds fly up. Do not move around a lot or make noise because they will pick you out. Public land birds that are spooked the night before do do remember. And will be on alert the next morning. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, they, they don't remember the night before. Bull, heck, yeah, they don't. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Yep. Do not call the birds if they've already been, if they've already given their location by gobbling or flying up. Simply just sit, observe, and take inventory of the surroundings. Now, like Chris says, there is a situation where if you, you know, a lot of times if I think there's a lone gobbler. Yeah. And right before dark, I give them a little bit of Never. like, there's a hen over here. The next morning, he's going to be going ballistic, and he remembers that, oh, there's a hen over there. Yep. Um, and, and one more reason why I don't call a lot to them if they've already given their location is I don't want to alert any other. I don't want the bird. If I hear him one time and I've got him pinned, I would just assume he never gobble again. So don't sit there and owl hoot at him. Don't sit there and do anything. To, I hear it all the time on public ground. It just drives me crazy. Guys will get a bird roosted. It's obvious they got them roosted, and they'll just sit there and pester them while it's in the tree. Well, every time you call to that bird, whatever call you're using, your chances the next morning keep dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. Your percentage, every time you call to him, whether it be a coyote, an owl, or whatever, a crow, they're going to figure out, that ain't right. I'm, I'm shock gobbling to it, but I know in the morning that I'm going to – Keep my mouth quiet, and I'm going to fly and get the heck away from here. Do not call to those birds when they're up in the tree. Well, and, and you touched on it real briefly there. The other thing, too, is if you get that bird cranking, if there's other hunters scouting that valley or that ridgeline or whatever that evening, guess where they're going to be next morning? Right, exactly. I'd rather him gobble once. No one else picked up on it, and I can just slip in the next morning and have him pitch out, land in my decoys, and I can shoot him. Yeah, exactly. Now, here's a here's a huge deal, in my opinion. Plan your quiet exit and quiet re-entry point for the morning. Yeah. So as I'm roosting a bird, I'm also looking at where is the bird going to fly down? Where do I need to be set up? How do I get in here in the morning in the pitch black dark and be in the exact right spot? Um. I'm going to go through some more of this, and then we'll come back to these because there's a lot to talk about. Plan your setup for the morning. Look for the exact place that you want to be sitting for the next morning. Um, many times we'll stay till pitch black dark and then advance forward to mark exact spot on GPS where to set up. Be careful not to use any light or make any human sounds because they will be on alert and you will have blown your chance for the morning. Count your steps to a marked location so that you know the exact distance to your setup tree. Uh, use the two-man locator system, uh, and we can talk about that in a minute. On the way back to the truck, listen for other birds that might be gobbling from the roost. Mark their locations as well. And known roosting areas can be a great place to sit in the afternoons and just wait for them to come. Call lightly and have decoys spread out. Now, that's if the season's already rolling. One thing I want to go back to is this plan your, um, let's actually take a quick break here, Chris. Sure. Guys, I want to tell you about a special promotion that Canyon Coolers is doing. Uh, there's two ways to enter, and they're, they're giving away several prizes. The first place winner is going to win a Canyon Coolers Outfitter 55-quart cooler with a retail value of $229. Uh, with an SC Wake Sea Deck top and hot hands gear. The second and third place winners will all win a Canyon Coolers Tumbler and Hot Hands products. There are several ways you can enter. Uh, one is on social media. You can like or follow at Canyon Coolers uh, and you can leave a comment or tag a friend. Also, for this uh, promotion, the normal J. Scott 19 promo code usually gets you a 10% discount at Canyon Coolers. It's actually for a, a week's period of time going to get you a 15% discount. 
to enter this giveaway, follow the link in the show notes and enter your email address. The winner will be announced on March 21st and will be notified by email. It's open to continental U.S. only. The cooler and other gear have been provided by CanyonCoolers.com, SC Wake, and Hot Hands. I want to thank Canyon Coolers for their sponsorship, and I want to thank you guys for jumping in and trying to win, win these great prizes. I want to go back to uh, planning your entrance and your exit. So that night you've got a bird or birds roosted. You're, you've tried to figure out where you're going to set up. You've got the place where you're going to set up. And so then the question is, do I let it get pitch black dark, slip into that area and set up decoys? That's number one. Number two is how can I get from where I'm sitting right now out of here without those birds detecting that I'm a human. And number three is how do I get from my vehicle or if I'm camped or whatever, how do I get from there to not only where I'm sitting right now, but where I need to be sitting where the birds are in the morning without them hearing me? Well, I will tell you that if you go early, 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 pitch black dark, your best chance is when they're totally asleep. If you are waiting to enter into the woods when it is gray light, you are too late. Way too late, yes. You cannot get right up by those birds if it's gray light. They will see you. The hens are awake. Just like when you're actually under, you know, 50 to 100 yards from a roost tree, you know that sometimes at 4.30 in the morning, they're gobbling. Yes. And the hens have already been calling for 15 minutes. Yep. So... If it's gray light, you're too late. Turkey, and, so, and that's the thing. You're you're dead on, Jay. People always think, oh well, turkeys have such great great eyesight; they can see color and blah blah blah. But they, you know, oh, they they for some reason people think, well, but they don't see well at night because they don't see like deer and elk and everything. Well, true, they don't have night vision like deer and elk do, but they see just as well as we do in low light. So if you can see, they can see. Now, here's the other flip side of that. Keep in mind, they're up in a tree, 20 feet, 30, 40, whatever, however. They're up in a tree. They've got a more commanding view. If we're talking about us walking around on the ground, if there's snow cover, you stand out like a sore thumb. From there, And you're crunching crunching or whatever, you stand out like a sore thumb. Likewise, if it's, you know, a lot of, you know, if you're talking to under Ponderosa Pine in these western mountains, a lot of the grasses, if it's not super, super green, it's going to be a light tan to a light brown, and the, the pine needles are going to be a light tan to a light brown, which means you, again, are going to be standing out against a, a your dark body, because of the shadow, is going to be standing out against a light-colored background. Those birds are going to pick... They don't, even, they don't even have to know that you're a human. All they know is there is something shady going around, going on down around underneath where I was going to pitch out. So even though he might gobble, the hens might yelp, they go on and do everything they normally do up on that roost. They're going to pitch out and go 180 degrees the other direction because there was danger over there underneath that roost, and I'm not... I, I don't trust it. I'm going to go the other direction. Right, and I think that goes back to people need to know the difference between you know gobbling and everything's fine to shock gobbling, and they're just gobbling. Yeah. They're spooked as all get out, and they're still gobbling. Yes. Like it's not really a roosting situation, but I've I've hunted with a lot of people, and and you know b- birds will be going away from you, and they'll be going. They're still gobbling. Let's keep going. Yeah. I'm like. That we need to go find a new bird. That bird is gobbling because they're spooked and excited and they're, you know, trotting and running and trying, you know, they're gobbling just because they gobble. Well, they're gobbling because I'm leaving. I want the hens that are around and anybody else to know I'm going this way. Again, a gobble is attractive saying I'm over here. I want, you know, if you want to be with me, this is where I am. So he's going to be running away and he'll probably still be gobbling because he's letting the hens that he believes are around, especially if he heard you calling. He thinks there might be other turkeys around. He thinks there might be hens around. He still wants those hens. But I'm getting the heck out of Dodge, and this is the direction I'm going. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
I want to talk about your re-entry point in the morning. So yes. if I have a bird roosted, I am either going to dis- determine if I can get to a good place where I think would be good in the morning and I can set out my decoys. I'm a, I use decoys. I love decoys. If I can get there and set my decoys up, I will a lot of times in the evening. Now, you have to literally sit there until it's pitch black dark, and it's a gamble. You're better off probably not doing it, but if you do like to use decoys, it has to be pitch black dark, which means you have to get from where you're at to where you think you need to be in the dark with no light, and not only that, when you get there, you have to be able to set your decoys up quietly, not clanking stakes. Mm-hmm. And if you make human noises, you, like we said, your percentage of kill goes way down. Okay? So, and then I'm, a lot of times too, what I'll do is maybe I won't set the decoys up because maybe I won't even have the decoys with me. But I'm going to say, okay, if I can get another 100 yards, I need to be set up in that little meadow right there. That's where I'm planning. I'll let it get pitch black dark. I'll slide over there very quietly, and I'll have inside my jacket covered up where there's no way they can see my light. I'll mark it, or I'll mark the spot that I'm sitting in and know that I have to go another 100 steps, so I'll try and figure out how many steps is it from where I'm at to where that meadow is. So the next morning, I can walk into the place where I was using a GPS inside my jacket so they can't see the light and okay I'm at my spot turn the GPS off put it in my pack or you know in my vest trying to let my eyes you know adjust the whole time and then I'm going to walk from there I'm going to count my steps 80 steps 100 steps whatever I had determined or go to the big ponderosa and then go 50 steps from that and that should put me in a good spot I will tell you most of the time in the morning when I go on a ro- a bird that I have roosted, I chicken out and I don't get close enough to the bird because I don't want to spook them. So one of my biggest faults is I know in the morning when I'm walking and creeping in, I know I need to go further, but I'm a scaredy cat and I don't end up going far enough and I set up in a bad spot. And I would encourage you, if under darkness, black, pitch black, you could literally walk underneath their tree. But I am a scaredy chicken, and I don't want to do it, even though I know I can. And this year, I'm going to encourage myself to go ahead and go that extra 50 yards that I know I need to clear. But when you're walking in the morning, and it's crunching on pine needles, and it's going crunch, 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 they're dead asleep, but you just know they're going to wake up. But I'm, you know, it could be 3 o'clock in the morning. They're not waking up for another hour and a half. Make yourself go to where you told yourself you have to go. That's a huge fault that I have is I don't go far enough. Backing up, that evening I'm going to mark my spot. I'm going to go back to my truck. The whole time I'm going back to my truck or my quad or whatever, I am listening for other hunters. I am, you know, listening for other sounds. And I get back to my truck. Let's say that there's another vehicle parked next to mine. What am I going to do? I'm going to wait till that person comes out, comes up to his truck. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to be polite. And I'm going to say, how's it going? What are your plans in the morning? Well, I heard a bird roosted down this ridge. I'm going to try and determine, are they going after the same bird that I'm going after? If they do, I'll either say, you know, that's the bird I was going to go after, go for it. If I feel like I have enough rapport with the hunter, I'll say, you know, that's the bird I was going to go after. What do you think we ought to do? What do you think about just doing a coin flip? Where you say, you know, or if you have other areas and you just want to let them go, just say, buddy, you take that bird, you know, good luck, hope you get them. Sometimes you can say, hey, you know, it sounds like we're after the same bird. What do you want to do? Maybe we ought to flip a coin, you know. You, you can call it or you can flip it or whatever, and, you know, whoever wins the coin toss goes in there. Maybe that's a fair way to do it. Or maybe I get to my truck and there's no one there, and 
I then maybe will sit there for a while and see if anybody else comes around and stops or maybe I'll drive up the road one way or another and try and determine is there anybody else in the country at all. Okay, so I drove a mile this way, I drove a mile back this way, nobody's around. Okay, I should have birds there in the morning. I come back in the morning, guys don't park on your birds. It, it's a fine line between parking close enough where you know another person's going to come after you in the morning, they're going to see your vehicle, they're going to go on down the road. And then if you park too far away from your birds, they may think, oh, well, I'm going to go three quarters of a mile down the road and park. They may be right where you're at. So that, that's a little bit of a fine line. And we could talk for hours on that subject alone. I'm just trying to cover as much as what I'm thinking when I'm roosting these birds. And then in the morning when I go in, I always want to be the first person there. I go way, way, way early. I go, I'm usually sitting on my roost tree and listening for an hour to other hunters driving all over the unit, coming and going and, you know, driving. And I'm thinking, how in the world are they driving right now? I'm hearing hens yelp and these guys are still driving. So be early, okay? The next morning, I'm retracing my steps. I'm getting to that spot where I've marked and then I'm, I, you can't use a light. You can use a light to a certain point, but when you feel like you're getting, you know, pretty close to your birds, say, you know, I'm going to say two or three hundred, four hundred yards, you, you cannot use a light. Now, you could walk right up under a turkey if they're asleep and it's dark enough. You could walk with a light the whole way up and shine it on them. But can you walk with the light, them see the light, and then you try and call the birds, I'm going to say most of the time, no. Yeah. Chris, take it over. All right, man. No, you, you nailed one, and, I, and I'm going to jump right on, on the first one about parking, because um, I agree with pretty much everything that you said. <clears throat> when, you, when you're dealing with public land and you're dealing with access, You've got to really play that strategy on where to park because I agree with everything that Jay just said. Sometimes I have I have dealt with this myself. You're going to enter. You're going to encounter two different philosophies, two different styles of hunters. There are some hunters that take it seriously, like Jay and I, and probably most of you listening right now, that are going to go out there and they're going to do the work. You're going to do the work, and you're going to be smart about it, and you're going to hunt smarter rather than harder, and you're and you're going to you're you're going to put the effort in to make this happen the way it needs to happen. However, you're going to encounter people that literally turkey hunt by driving down the road and finding out where everybody else is turkey hunting. They'll let you do the work, and then the next morning, oh, there's a truck parked there. There must be birds here. I'm going to pull in right behind him. And I'm going to go walk down this ridge, and I'm going to see where these birds are, and then I'm just going to beat them to it. Literally, you will have people to do that. So, yeah, if you park next to your bird, you very well may end up having somebody park right next to you because they saw your vehicle parked there. Whereas, if you park three-quarters of a mile or half a mile away, and you encounter a diligent hunter that does the work themselves, they're like, oh, well, that person's hunting there. I don't want to stop on them. I'm going to go a half mile, three quarters of a mile down the road, and I'll try here. Well, inadvertently, he might be, he or she might be right on top of you. So you have to play, you, judge how and where you park based on the other pressure in and around your area. Okay. So, for instance, if I know there's multiple birds around in an area, and there's only a handful of people hunting, I very well may just pull off away from the bird I want to go at and just go off and, you know, just kind of, I can park, you know, say, I'm sorry, phone was ringing. I can park, say, a quarter of a mile away and walk down a different ridge. I, I, earlier, we had talked about uh, using your hand as that, you know, as the kind of ridge and, and some of our roads will cut across the mountainside to where I might be able to park on one little finger ridge, but I might actually hunt a bird that's two finger ridges over. All right, and I'll just use my vehicle as a decoy off to the side. That's probably most of the time what I do. However, if I know that there's very few birds in this area, 
but I know that there's a lot of other hunters that are hunting the area, it's quite likely that they found the same birds that I did. That's where, I'm sorry, I agree, Jay, I'm going to try to be the first person there. I'm going to try to be the first person there, and I'm going to park my vehicle uh, literally on the finger ridge or as clo- wherever the most common place to park to go after that particular bird. I'm going to try to beat them. I'm going to try to be the first there, first one there. I'm just going to park it and basically try to claim my spot. Okay, you're, you're going to have to judge where you park and how you access uh, based on the pressure in your area. Now, here's one thing that I will say that I do different, and and something to consider if you know that you are going to be competing with other hunters, and especially if you know that you're going to be, you know, combat hunting. That's what I call, you know, where people just try to shadow you and just try to, you know, they're setting up 50 yards from you and trying to, you know, call the birds. If the road access is close by, Say, for instance, this little finger ridge. The birds are roosted on the end of this particular finger ridge, but then like a quarter of a mile away up that ridge is a road access. 90% of the hunters are just going to walk down that little finger ridge, and they're going to come from the road direction, and they're probably going to be set up between where the bird is roosted and where that vehicle is parked. Now, you might be dealing with a two-year-old bird that doesn't know any better. But if you're talking about these public land birds, you can have hens that might be four, five, six years old, maybe. They're educated. They know what's going on. So if I know I'm in a situation where I have to be strategic in how I access my birds, what I will do, I will do everything that Jay just talked about is with GPS and everything else. But I will find a spot to set up that is literally 180 degrees opposite of the road access. So literally, I will walk around the birds. So it's basically the the parking lot, road access, birds, then me. Because if I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times this has worked for me as far as getting A, birds to respond, and then me B, killing them. I've seen numerous times where people try to locate birds between where they are and where the road is. So that means the person was standing halfway or whatever between the road and where the birds were, and they never set a peep. Whereas, all of a sudden, I am on the other side of those, away from the road access, and man, they will respond to everything I give them. Why? They've just been educated that anything coming from that particular direction is likely danger and a hunter, whereas, quote-unquote, no one calls to me from over here except a, a real hen. So I will go all the way around them, get set up on the back side of them, so that way, even if someone parks, so I'll, I'll maybe I'll park two ridges over. I will go down the ridge in the in the pitch black in the morning, hike over across. I'll use that GPS. I'll, I'll go down one ridge, cross two others, and I will get set up on the opposite side of those birds. So that way, if another hunter, whether purposefully or accidentally, sets up on the same birds I am. They're more likely to go to me because they haven't been conditioned to danger towards the road. And if that other hunter accidentally bumps them or gets set up too close or uses a headlamp, gets too close to the roost, whatever, bumps them off the roost, guess where they're going? My direction. Right exactly. I think that's a great point, and I also think it's a good time to mention that, and I said this, and Darn, I did a seminar for the Desert Christian Archers, and I'm talking to public land turkey hunters. In my opinion, if you're set up on birds, whether they be roosted or whether it be a run-and-gun situation set up and it's light, and you're on one side, and all of a sudden you hear what you know is a human on the other side or any side, in my opinion, I stand up and say, Hunter, Hunter, Hunter over here, and I blow the whole deal. If, if it's a situation where the Hunter is going to be getting into range of you or those turkeys and potentially, you know, if, he, if he's calling from three quarters of a mile away or a half a mile, that's one thing. But at any given time on public ground, if I feel like another hunter is getting within, say, a hundred yards of, of the bird that I'm working, I'm sorry. I, I'm either going to slip out 
go the opposite direction, or I'm going to immediately identify myself, which is going to blow the bird. It's going to blow the whole thing. Yeah, the other hunter's going to be, most of them will be upset with you. The reality is it's not worth having a misfire or a, a crossfire situation, having a hunter that doesn't realize that you're a hunter or doesn't care that you're a hunter. Yeah. I would rather blow the whole deal and find another bird later that day than to get shot. So I think it's important that you cannot call to other birds that other hunters are working. You cannot work the same birds. Yes, you can call birds away from another hunter to you, but the second that you feel like that other hunter may be sneaking in on you, it makes me feel very awkward and very uneasy that I'm going to get shotgun pellets shot at that bird that's going to miss that bird and hit me that's sitting directly behind. So um, enough of that. Make sure that you guys do your best to, you know, cooperate with your fellow hunters and communicate. Now, you're going to run across some hunters that you're doing your best to try and make the playing field equal you're doing your best to be polite. You're being your best to be to be fair. You're doing your best to be safe. And the other hunter's not going to have it. You're going to be the jerk. You're going to be the guy who says, don't tell me where to go. Yeah. yeah. You, and you just have to shake that off because some people, that's just the way they are. It, you, you try and say, hey, um, we're both parked in the same spot. I was parked here first. You know, what bur where are you going? Well, I'm going right down this ridge. Well, sometimes it's best to say, you know, that's where I was going to go and I'm here first. And maybe they'll say, you know, well, tough. At that point, I'm as much as I want to, you know, punch them in the nose. I'm probably just going to go get in my truck and say, you know, good luck to you. I hope you get them and go find another bird because it's not worth it. Yeah. it it's really not worth having con a confrontation with fellow hunters and, you know, Sometimes that might be the only bird they've heard gobble all season and emotions are high and you're going to end up getting a, you know, a scuffle over a turkey. It's just not worth it. And the, the other, and there was I yeah, I agree with all that all that. I mean, it, if I think a, a hunter is just honest mistake or just it's you know, with good intentions actually, you know, accidentally moves in on a bird that I'm working Safety first. Sometimes I'll just get up, back out. But if if it's if this person is just a blatant jerk and knows darn well, and he he just wants to engage, or he or she just wants to engage in combat hunting, oh yeah, they don't care about you. They don't care about your safety. They don't care about respecting your issue. I will do the same thing. I'll get up and I'll back out and I'll move out and I'll blow the whole setup. I'll I'll just blow the whole setup and then fine. Well, I'll come back tomorrow or whatever and I'll try to work it. But the other thing I was going to just real quick, Jay, before you move on, I was going to touch on. You know, when you're talking about doing stuff in the pitch black, I agree. I talk about that all the time. The other thing, too, is keep in mind, moonlight can be your friend or your enemy. Um, yeah. Because, again, if it's a bright, bright moon and you're trying to sneak in under that roost, again, if you can see relatively easily, they can, too. So you just need to keep that in mind. Use the moonlight to your advantage and sometimes, but also be, be cautious because the moonlight can screw you. I want to talk a little bit about, um, before, I want to talk about in a minute, uh, what happens if you don't have any birds roosted? You know, what am I doing? Let's say you roll into your hunting area, you know, at, at 10 o'clock at night, you didn't have a chance to roost birds. We're going to get to that. But first, I want to talk about the two man, um, locator. And before we ought to just take a break here before we talk about the two man locator system gohunt.com the gear shop my friend cody nelson the optics manager 40 uh 20 plus years not 40 20 plus years of friendship uh there with cody nelson he's the optics manager if you guys have any binocular spotting scope rifle scopes tripods uh any glassing needs uh any glassing questions whether it be technique uh, if you want to talk product, uh, Cody's the guy to talk to. Uh, tell him that uh, you heard about uh, Go Hunt Optics Department from me uh, here at the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I appreciate Go Hunt's support. Also, remember, guys, this is application season. 
uh, go to gohunt.com forward slash J Scott and you're going to get a $50 gift certificate at the Go Hunt gear shop just for signing up. It is the best Western hunting resource out there. Uh, Go Hunt Insider, I use it all the time when I'm looking at all these Western states trying to figure out the best draw odds and harvest statistics. I want to thank GoHunt.com, Optics Department, the Gear Shop, and the Insider, and uh, check them out. You can also see the show notes and get links uh, to uh, both the Insider and the Optics Department. Uh, guys, I also want to thank Kuyu. That's K U I U dot com. Kuyu dot com. Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. I want to thank Phonescope dot com. If you use the J Scott 19 promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount at Phonescope. That's the digiscoping uh, device that I use uh, to take photos and video on my iPhone 10. Uh, and I also want to thank onxmaps.com if you use the j scott 19 promo code you're going to get a 20 percent discount uh, go to onxmaps.com uh, you'll be able to buy the app uh, you can either buy it per state or you can buy the premium which is all 50 states then they will be sending you an email in that email you refer j scott and they'll give you a 20 percent discount uh, Onyx Maps is amazing. I use it every day out in the field. I also use it in my real estate business. Uh, it has great uh, overlay of property ownership. Uh, it has aerial and hybrid mode, uh, topo mode. Uh, it also has a breadcrumb feature that allows you to retrace your steps. Uh, I'm also downloading uh, information from the Onyx desktop to the mobile uh, it's just an amazing uh, product. I also import Google Earth Maps on Onyx Maps. And uh, go check them out. 20% discount. Okay, the two-man locator system can be deadly. And I, I'm sure, Chris, you've used it before. Um, we use it a lot where my hunting partner, whoever, you know, if I'm hunting with Dar or my, my nephews or my cousins or whoever, um let's say that it's starting to get dark or let's say that it's you know it's it's in the evening and it's gray light and a bird's gobbling down off quite a ways and you can't pinpoint where that bird is a lot of times i will say give me a handful of minutes you know depending on the distance you know four or five minutes give me 10 minutes and you stay here i'm going to work my way way down that ridge as fast as i can and if the bird shuts up, give me five minutes. So, you know, maybe you synchronize your watches or whatever. And you say, give them a, you know, give them a locator call. And you would ask, well, why aren't I going down the ridge and calling to that bird? Because I don't want to be too close to that bird and call to him like we talked about before. So I'll leave a buddy way up the ridge. I'll haul butt down the ridge and get there. And then I'll try and... As I'm going, I'm listening for that bird to gobble, but let's say they haven't made a peep. Then I'm moving in pretty close to where I think the bird is, and then I'm just going to stop and I'm going to wait. And I'm going to wait there and then wait for my cue to my buddy to hit the locator call and, you know, coyote howl or whatever he, you know, whatever he decides to use an elk bugle, and the bird, boom, gobbles. Well, a lot of times we have it set up where, you know, the, 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 we're going to do that location deal. We're going to do it a couple times. So then I'm going to move in a little bit closer if I have to. And I'm going to sit and wait for two or three, four minutes, whatever we've had designated. I'm going to wait. Boom, he's going to hit the call again. Boom, we got him roosted. I'm going to let it get totally black, you know, dark. I have it marked out. Boom, get back to the truck. And they'll say, you know, how'd you do? The other thing you can do in states where it's legal, if you give a guy a radio, you can say, okay, I'm in position. You know, this is getting pretty technical turkey hunting, but it works great. If, if it's legal in your state, okay, go ahead and hit them with the call. You know, coyote howl, boom, the bird gobbles. Hey, I need to go another, you know, quarter mile. I need to go another three, four, five hundred yards. Give me a second. Okay, so you cruise down the ridge. Okay, call again. Boom, he gobbles. You've got him pinpointed. Okay, I'm coming back. That's an effective way to do it as well.
No, there's, yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's anything that I could add to that. Most of the time, I'm just I'm solo hunting, so I don't I don't have anybody with me. But you're absolutely right. One of the things you know people forget to realize is that sometimes just by you being in close proximity, if they're educated birds, and you know they're you know call shy, so to speak, you know you getting close to them can actually make them shut up. They're a lot more likely to sound off if someone is off in the distance. So that the, the two person, you know, locations that, you know, tactic like that is just, it's awesome. I want to cover before we end this, and I know we're covering a lot of ground and this is a long episode, but I, I, I know it's important that <clears throat> a lot of times people ask, what do you do if you listen and you have no success roosting birds you know, what will you do the next morning going out fresh? And let's say that, you know, you've been working or whatever. You didn't even have a chance to scout. Now, a lot of people are in this position. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. If I've never hunted the area before, I may cover country either on ground or cover country in my vehicle at prime time. I may not even hunt that first morning. I may be just driving and listening Go another mile, turn the truck off, get out, coyote howl, or blow an owl hooter, or an elk bugle, whatever you use out here for Merriam's. I love the coyote owl. The, the birds respond very, very well to a coyote. But to be clear, I'm going to drive down the road. I'm going to stop, turn the truck off. I'm going to let the truck settle. I'm going to step off the road. I'm going to you know, give it a couple minutes. I'm going to coyote howl. Most of the time, if you coyote howl, they'll answer while you're in mid-bark, and you won't be able to hear it. So it's always nice if you have someone with you, have them listening also. And I may hear a bird, and I may say, you know what, let's go down the road, because all we're doing is scouting, trying to locate birds. This is also something you can do prior to the season when you're just trying to locate roosted birds. So you drive with your vehicle, you get out, you coyote howl, you say, okay, there's one on the left side, there's none on the right side, go down another mile, you know, or use half mile increments, mile increments, depending on your country, and you, you're just shotgun calling. You're just driving around and either A, listening, or B, trying to res uh, elicit a shock gobble uh, up in the tree, and you're basically marking, okay, there's three birds here, there's no birds, no birds, no birds. Okay, there's one bird here. And you're marking all that either on your map and or on your GPS. Um, uh, let's see. Sometimes the birds gobble to the truck. So the first two or three seconds when I stop, it's very important. Like I'll find, I'll look up and I'll see a place that I need to pull the truck over. I'm going to have the windows down. Yeah, it's cold. I'll pull the truck and immediately shut the truck off and listen because sometimes they'll shock gobble to your truck driving. So sometimes I'm going to listen for a little while right as I pull up. Then I'm going to quietly get out. If I don't hear anything, I'm going to let the truck settle. Boom. Then I'm going to go ahead and call, and, and then I'm going to repeat that process. Chris? I agree. Um, two couple things. One, you said you're going to shut the vehicle off and then kind of, walk away from the vehicle absolutely there's so many times i mean literally i had i'm not exaggerating on this and this is the sad part about it i wish i had a video camera with me back then literally a guy was going down the road doing exactly what we're talking about everything's fine except for the fact that he pulls off stops the vehicle leaves the vehicle running idling gets out sits on his bumper and then calls with the vehicle running and wondered why he never got a response. Whereas I'm sitting literally, uh, I was currently, or just before then, sitting 100 yards down on one of the little finger ridges, and there was a bird right down below me going nuts. Well, okay, you've got to be smart about it. Okay? Again, we always, I always talk about hunt smarter. Like Jay said, turn that vehicle off and listen quick because they might gobble. But if if you want to go beyond that, Walk away from the road. Walk away from the road. Get yourself off. Even if you have to go a couple hundred yards and then call, it makes a difference. Just like I talk about, or Jay and I talk about with the elk stuff, 
Elk know where you are. They they know where you're calling from. Well, turkeys are no different. They can pinpoint your location very, very well. So if they, they know where that road is, they were just strutting on it earlier. Okay? So if you're calling from the road, they know you're calling from the road. Get yourself off a couple hundred yards, and sometimes it will make a world of difference on how much response you get from your efforts, number one. Number two, if we're talking about prime, you know, what, you know, kind of the prime time during the season when, when the birds are rocking and rolling during the season, all of what we're talking about, whether we're talking about the morning or the evening, will give you a, a bigger window of opportunity to get these responses. However, if we are talking about preseason, end of March, beginning of April, keep in mind, sometimes, man, those birds are going to gobble once or twice off the roost, say we're doing this in the evening. They might just gobble once or twice on the roost, and it's literally within a, a five-minute window right before just pitch black. I mean, it you, you might not have a huge window of when they're responsive. So you have to judge your cruising in a vehicle efforts accordingly. So... If if they're not very vocal, they're not very fired up, and you think they're and they're only sounding off once or twice after dark, or once or twice on the roost in the morning, and then as soon as their toenails hit the ground, they shut up. A lot of times, I will ditch the vehicle, and I will just go and use strategic points on the mountain for me to listen. But if they're fired up and it's season, and I can run and gun like this, then absolutely hit those roads and cover ground. Chris, if you had to pick your number one locator call, what would it be? Ooh. That's tough because it's I my probably for me it would be an owl hoot. And when I say an owl hoot, it's my modified modified version of an owl. I do it with my voice. And I just sound out just, I uh, just, whoo, whoo, I just as loud as I can and let that just echo across the, the mountains. That typically for me is, is one that, that gets the most responses. I've had some places where the coyote howl works great, but I've had some other places where they will just flat shut up on an owl, uh, on a coyote because the coyote predation is so good, that's so bad. Uh, there's, and you mentioned elk bugle. That works well. It can. The other thing too is a lot of people don't realize it. Again, if we're talking about you have ponds or lakes or, you know, stuff like that in the mountains, you can have nesting pairs of Canada geese move in. Oh, my gosh. Bring a goose call. You start hank honking and, and carrying on with a goose call, you'd be amazed at how many times a bird sounds off to the sound of a goose. So, but for me, most of the time, it's just that owl hoot. For me, out west, uh, Arizona... Um, hunting Merriam's for me, uh, coyote howler is, in my opinion, the best locator call. But I would say that if a bird is in the tree, um, they're going to answer coyote howler most every time. But if you blow it within 150 yards of a bird, he he most of the time will not answer. There you go. That's a, and that's a better that's a better qualification. Yeah. Yeah, and even during the day or even, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning, they will gobble to a coyote howler, but you have to watch that, you know, you don't know what's, you know, within two, 300 yards of you, and a lot of times they won't answer. Now, will they answer out there across the ridge five or 600 yards? Yeah, but what did you just alienate that's, you know, within, you know, 200 yards of you that, you know, uh, you know, would have answered if you'd have blown a crow call. Yeah, I know my friend uh, Casey uses a a raven. Yep, I was he just actually, say that. Yep. actually blows a real obnoxious raven call and gets some unbelievable response with it. Yeah, um, crow call is good, but to me, in the dark, uh, coyote howler is 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 my number one call. Um, to get birds to gobble. Yeah, and, and, and I, I'm glad you brought the raven up because some people, you know, say, "Well, what about a crow call during the day?" Yeah, sometimes they work great, if you, especially if you have got if you have crows in the area. But just keep in mind, in some of our intermountain areas, you might actually not have crows and just really have ravens. And so, yeah, I don't want to say match the hatch with 
with your locator calls, but kind of you do. You you got to kind of go with what is locally available that the birds are used to gobbling to. Absolutely. Chris, that's been awesome. We covered a lot of ground here on roosting turkeys, uh, western style, and I uh, want to thank you. want to give you a chance to tell the listeners how they can find you. Yeah, you bet. Like we talked about on uh, the YouTube stuff, you know, all of my stuff is just rowhuntingresources.com. You know, that, that's R O E, right? That's correct. Yeah, R O E huntingresources.com is our website. Uh, we've got a subscription based educational site there, and we've got a turkey module that some of this stuff is. It's more geared toward Rio Grande turkeys and, and learning river bottom stuff, but there's a pile of information on the turkey stuff, but um, YouTube channel, Row Hunting Resources, Instagram, Facebook, we're, and Twitter, we're, I'm all on that. You can look up that too as well, but for anybody here that does, if you, if you guys want to see some of the stuff that I do or if you want to subscribe, you know, if you get in and you, you get to the subscription page and it says, you know, promo code, if you guys put in a, a J. Scott podcast, all one word, doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter if there's caps or not, but just J. J. Scott podcast in the promo code, it'll take 20% off and, and we support you guys that way. So, Awesome, buddy. I really appreciate uh, you coming on and talking about roosting turkey. So we've covered scouting and we've covered... Uh, roosting strategies and how to roost turkeys uh, and uh, we have also um, we, we are going to be doing uh, setup tactics and some calling and decoys so uh, great comprehensive stuff here appreciate your time as always absolutely no it's always a blast so I appreciate it thank you